Welcome to Under the Radar, a show about independent iOS app development. I'm Marco Arment. And I'm David Smith. Under the Radar is never longer than 30 minutes, so let's get started. Both you and I, Marco, had a, I guess, a slightly belated Christmas present this year um, in that we both are, I believe, currently sitting in front of a brand new uh, primary development computers, um, specifically uh, iMac Pros. And I think it seemed like an interesting topic to talk about. Both, I think there's some interesting things to un- unpack a little bit about the machine itself. Um, I think it's probably also interesting to talk about why we both use this particular um, setup, which I think is, if I had to guess, a my minority of people use you know use a an iMac or in the, you know in this case an iMac Pro um, as a as a primary machine versus using a laptop. And then I think it's also whenever I get a new machine, which is fairly rare, you know fairly rare. It's think you know it's not some not something that I have to do very often. It's an interesting opportunity to kind of look at my development setup, see how portable it is, and kind of take and take inventory on all the different things that you have to do to set one up. Um, and I think that process, hopefully there's a few things to, to share and to, um, to learn from there. But um, first, I think maybe an interesting place to start is why do you use an iMac rather than a, a laptop as your primary machine? I've done both. Like I've spent years as a laptop as my, as my only machine and then just plugging it into a monitor, keyboard and mouse like when I was at work and then bringing it home every day. And this is a very, very common situation people people use. Um, and, and there are a lot of advantages to just having the laptop like that. Um, first of all, you know, cost wise, you only have to buy and maintain and upgrade and, and you know, later buy again one computer. Um, you know, th- there's a there's a pretty big question among a lot of people's minds about like do you need a laptop at all or can you just get an ipad um but for a lot of developers that that that, you know there is no question for a lot of developers the answer is you can't do what you need to do on an ipad or it would be so cumbersome that that it would be you know very not uh practical for you so a lot of developers need laptops and so then the question only becomes do you have one computer or two you know if you're going to have one uh, you have a lot of advantages and things like you don't have to worry about how you sync files between them, how you, you know, ha- whether you set them up the same way and how like, oh, I, I forgot to install this app on this computer or it's configured differently. And you can't quite figure out how the heck do I get Photoshop settings to look the way they look like my other, on my other computer, uh, things like that. Like there's there's a lot of like pains in the butt around maintaining multiple computers um, that you if you just had the laptop, you're totally fine with. On the other hand, when you only have one and say something goes wrong and you need to bring it in for service and be without it for a few days, uh, you are kind of out of luck and you, you, know, you have a problem in that situation. Um, so there are advantages both ways. Uh, if you have multiple computers, you can also um, intentionally set things up differently between them. So you can have like, you know, your work desktop that it has certain things on it versus your personal laptop or vice versa. Um, you can have, you know, y- your windows will will be preserved on your desktop and you can come down, come down and, you know, sit down in front of it and start work immediately as opposed to, uh, you know, plugging in your laptop, rearranging everything, you know, ch- closing the things you were running at home, starting the things you're running at work. So there, there are advantages and disadvantages on both sides. Um, I personally find the ergonomics of a laptop for long-term work pretty rough um, when it's used as a laptop. So I find that for, for getting work done all day, I really want to be sitting in front of a desktop screen positioned you know, away from my face by a few feet, lifted up to the right height, and then a keyboard that is low in front of me and a split ergonomic natural keyboard because that's the style that I find most comfortable ergonomically that, that reduces my RSI issues. Um, a, a mouse on one on on my right side, a trackpad on my left side, so I have two input devices, one for each hand. This is the kind of setup I like, and then the monitor should be as big as possible uh, because that is directly related to how happy I can be and how productive I am with what I'm doing on my computer. All that basically leads to you know either the laptop plugged into a big monitor and keyboard when you're working or the iMac, and really either of these options are totally fine, but when you use a laptop as a desktop, it's not a very good desktop. Uh, you, you not only have issues with like you know just the pains of connecting and disconnecting it every day and bringing it back and forth, uh, but then also laptops don't cool themselves very well under sustained load or especially if you're using it in clamshell mode where the laptop is closed and you're plugging a monitor in, it really doesn't cool itself well. Um, they're usually louder when they're under load because they have these little, little tiny fans. Um, they usually have lower powered parts. Um, the, the laptops tend to 
lag behind the consumer IMAX in CPU performance by a couple of years and GPU performance by maybe more. Um, you know, laptops are more constrained with things like what kind of storage you can put in them, how much storage, how, what kind of upgrades, uh, how much RAM you can put in in the current lineup, um, and then things like ports and, and peripherals and you know, desktops just have more ports and different ports and better ports usually. And so there's desktops can be better in a number of ways. And I really like having both the the like reliable consistent setup where like my desktop screen never changes size so the windows are always in the right spots and, and everything's always like where i left it and and all the apps can stay running or not stay running or whatever else um you can have stuff running in the background that like serves media to your house for instance because it's never asleep or never closed or never off or whatever else so there's a lot of advantages to a desktop and i think the, the decision is made even easier when you work at home for yourself then you don't have to worry like about having the same computer between work and home. All these reasons, I just really like having a desktop. If you are a developer and you get a desktop computer, the one you probably want is the iMac. Gotta say, it's it's a great computer. Like even and for the last three years, I used a, a regular 5K, like you know, non-pro iMac because the, the iMac Pro didn't exist. Um, I used a regular iMac, and it's great. Uh, it is, you know, th- they're pretty good machines. They they really are very compelling with. The features you get, the the combination of like the nice screen, the 5K, you know, Retina 5K resolution, and, and this beautiful color screen and everything, and having everything be you know fairly tidy, fairly all in one. Um, it's it's just a really nice overall package. So I use an iMac in general, and not even considering whether it's a pro or not, because a it's a desktop, b it's a really good desktop, <laughs> uh, and and c I, I think it's the best choice and and in many ways the only choice uh in in apple's current lineup for the kind of things that i like yeah and i think i use a an imac for the same re- many of the same reasons like i've used the a retina imac uh since like I, I bought a maxed out first generation retina imac like as soon as i could get a retina screen in you know the 27 inch um size I mean, that was huge. I remember how just at the time, how amazing that was for things like doing iOS simulator work on the iPad, where like the old sim- iPad simulator, like would just be, or any of the simulators, honestly, would just be these comically huge things. And it's like, what? I can have a retina, you know, monitor that's this big. So that was what sold it for me initially. And then I just got used to it and I really like it. And in some ways, like some of the things are kind of silly. Like I like that my, yeah, I like that my, like, I have a work setup and that work setup for me, you know, is downstairs. And when I'm at work, I'm at work and I don't have a comfortable, a, a, like my most comfortable place to work is down at that desk. And it, I think it helps with the temptation to like work in other places or at other times when I maybe shouldn't be working because, you know, I feel very separate when I'm down here working. And so like I can still, you know, I have a, an, a, an, a 12 inch macbook that i can do work on um it's a little certainly slower and smaller and not as good but i can get work done there but it's it's uncomfortable and so it's a nice thing that i have like this super comfortable great place to work and then i have a place that i can work um and then yeah i've just rather than dealing with the like i've done, tried all manner of things for dealing with the kind of like the two computer problem i mean there was actually even a period where i had a um, an external drive uh, like i bought a external external uh, ssd hard drive that i would boot from and so i would plug it into my imac <laughs> um and boot from that for a boot, boot from that and then if i wanted to use it on my laptop i would unplug it and plug it into my laptop and boot from it there um which works like surprisingly well but is just like in kind of mind bending um in, like it's, for, it's a little cumbersome <laughs> cumbersome is a good word yes <laughs> it, it was not the most straightforward and so instead i just well i just work from my imac and uh, it's worked out very well for me. Like I'm, I, I was a little bit skeptical to start with, and I think I used to also come from a world where I, I used to having the the two monitor sit setup. Like I, I was a very, I used, I typically had like my previous setup often was you know laptop up on a stand, so it wasn't like ergonomically going to cripple me, um, and then a a big main display that was plugged into it. And I liked having the two monitors, but. Honestly, once like once the monitors went retina, like I really don't miss having the two monitors set up anymore. Like I like having just one big retina monitor, you know. And from a pixel perspective, it's like I have four monitors, I guess. Um, from a you know the number of the amount of detail that I'm able to to reasonably look at. So, you know, like an, an iMac is the machine for me, 
And really, at this point, you know, it was just a question of should I stick with the the re- just the regular five K uh, iMac, or you know, now that there's a you know the, the Pro model, I am a Pro. You know, is it something that I should go to? And in the end, I decided it, it made sense based on um, just all, you know a variety of things that I guess we'll get into a lot of them around performance and ports and just trying to. You know, it's like if I use this machine so much, I want to make sure that it's the best that I can reasonably have because it's it's what I use to make, you know, my entire living. So it may as well be a sharp tool. Exactly. And moving back just a moment to the dual monitor thing, uh, I, I, I forgot, for, forgot to mention that, but like I too went through, you know, a period where I used dual monitors and, you know, and where, you know, first one of them was the laptop on a stand and then, you know, a big monitor. Usually at, at that time I was using 24 inch monitors next to it. Um, and then, you know, eventually I upgraded to the laptop with a 30 inch monitor, which is the same resolution as you know, 27s that are in IMAX. Um, and then I, I, I decided that, you know, after years of using dual monitors this way, I learned that I really don't use dual monitors very effectively. That, you know, one of them would always be like the primary. And then this, whatever the secondary monitor was, like off to the right or whatever, it was just like a junk drawer. Like I would just I would have like you know oh maybe I put like my email client or you know Twitter or iTunes like over there, but it's like that it didn't really serve any purpose. I wasn't usually looking over there, and it didn't serve any purpose. That just like hiding those windows when I wasn't using them wouldn't also serve just as well. Like I didn't I found that I I was not well suited to dual monitors. I thought I was for a while, and if I'm gonna have you know only a 24 inch size, sure give me a second one. But once I stepped up to the 27 slash 30 inch size, I realized that just having one larger monitor worked better for me. And it allowed me to to avoid a lot of just like bugs and OS weirdness around dual monitors. Uh, Certain apps still don't really behave well with dual monitors. Um, There are certain other issues like... If one of them is your laptop screen and the other is like an external monitor, then you'll have usually a different pixel density between them. So like if you move a window to the to the you know other monitor, it'll appear physically smaller or bigger <laughs> because the two monitors have different pixel densities um, and all sorts of, you know, just weird little like OS weirdness uh, around having dual monitors where like clearly Mac OS supports dual monitors, but there are certain things that get a little iffy with them or that don't work the way you expect or things like full screen mode that kind of don't work at all, um, you know, or, or have weird limitations. And it's just the entire computer experience I find for myself. And, you know, this is personal preference, but I find for myself just works a lot more smoothly and better and cleaner with just with one monitor that is as big as it can be rather than having two separate ones. Yeah, exactly. And it's it, now, now that I'm used to it, it just feels like the right way to do it, and I, I, I don't. I never feel lacking for space. Yeah, even when I'm doing, you know, I have lots of windows open. Like I use a, I think a tool a tool called Size Up, which I know there's millions of these, but where I can easily make a a, a window a, an exact quarter of my screen, um, and I find that works really well um, to just be able to like keep it organized, but to be able to you know take full advantage of it. We are sponsored this week by Linode. With Linode, you'll have access to a suite of powerful web hosting options with prices starting at just $5 a month. You can be up and running with your own virtual server in the Linode cloud in under a minute. Whether you're just getting started with your first server or deploying a complex system, Linode is the right choice for you. They offer the fastest hardware and network with fantastic customer support behind it all. It's never been easier to launch a Linode cloud server. They guarantee 99.9% uptime for server availability, and once your server is up, they intend to keep it that way. And Linode offers additional storage, too. They now have block storage, which is now out of beta and available in their Fremont and Newark data centers, and they plan to expand their block storage to all data centers by June. Linode is great for tasks like hosting large databases, running a mail server, operating a VPN, running Docker containers, hosting a private Git server, and so much more. And Linode is hiring right now. If this sounds interesting to you, go to linode.com slash careers to learn more. 
So Linode has fantastic pricing options available. Their plans start at 1 gig of RAM for just $5 a month. And they also offer high memory plans starting with 16 gigs of RAM if you need that. As a listener of this show, sign up at linode.com slash radar to support us and get $20 towards any Linode plan. On the 1 gig plan, that's four free months. And with a 7-day money-back guarantee, there is nothing to lose. So go to linode.com slash radar to learn more, sign up, and take advantage of that $20 credit or use promo code radar twenty seven at checkout. Thank you so much to Linode for supporting our show. So we both now have uh, iMac Pros, and I think we have almost identical ones. I know we both we both got the 10 core model, I believe, and then I got the lower spec uh, video card, the two terabyte drive, and I feel like it's 64 gigs of memory is what I ended up with. <laughs> I love that you I, don't know how much RAM you have. But I had to check too. <laughs> it's like, it's enough. Yeah. I got the exact same setup, but four gigs instead of, or four terabytes instead of two terabytes on the SSD. So, yeah. And so, I mean, and I picked that configuration a little bit from your, your advice in terms of like the 10, the 10 core seems to be a reasonable trade off in terms of cost and performance and, um, you know, seem to be reasonable. I got a base, the base video card. Cause I just, I don't think anything I do is ever going to really tax it. Or at least the, if, you know, every now and then when I happen to do some final cut pro work for like an app preview or a YouTube video and the export takes a little bit longer, like it's so rare that that's not something I'm worried about. But overall, I think my initial impressions is that it's like, it is noticeably faster. It's noticeably snappier and like, is it is a tangible improvement which you, you never really know like um it's also at this point honestly it's the funny thing of i've been using it for a couple of weeks and so now my main my brain is entirely recalibrated itself to this is normal so it's even hard to remember which is always something to keep in mind with these kind of improvements where you'll notice them for a day or two and then you just get used to it and then this is the new normal and so when it takes you know it's it's not, not, things still aren't instantaneous or there are many things that still aren't like when i hit you know, build and run, it still takes a moment for Xcode to like do its stuff. And so until those times actually go to zero, it's still going to, I'm still going to be aware of performance as a thing, but, um, you know, overall I'm very happy with it. And I think I'm, it, it's more, it was just about, it was time to, to upgrade from my, uh, my earlier computer. And I think it's a, it's a u- noticeable upgrade, whether or not it was an essential one, it's hard to say. Um, I think I was starting to notice some you know, like my older computer, every now and then would have um, some uh, image retention issues or things like that that I was starting to notice. That it's like, well, it's maybe it's just time to to move on. And I think the three years I think it had been since I got that computer, it seemed like a reasonable time to upgrade. But like, it's a noticeable upgrade. It's a good upgrade. Uh, it's not like a mind bending. Like, wow, this is amazing. Now I can do all these things that I couldn't do before. But you know, welcome and well, welcome improvement, nevertheless. Yeah, I don't have much to add. I agree with everything you just said. I have all the exact same experiences, basically. Yeah, and so one thing I will say that I do do like is I like the having extra ports on the back. Um, I found that to be quite nice. Where we have previously on the previous generation IMAX, um, I only ha- I had four USB A plugs on the back, um, whereas now I have four of those and four USB C or. Th- yeah, I don't even know. There's probably the <laughs> Thunderbolt three ports, maybe as well. It's yeah, it's both. It's they are Thunderbolt three USB C ports. Great, whatever those are, the, the small skinny ones. Um, I have four of those as well, and that's been a welcome uh, improvement. But like, I plug a backup drive into one of those. Like, I have a, a, a Thunderbolt three backup drive that I plug in there, and I do uh, daily snapshots onto. And so it's nice to not have to because the one thing that I can never I find like I and you can never have enough USB A uh, uh, ports, and I mean. I even have one of them going into a 12 port hub. <laughs> yeah, me too. Um, I think mine's only 10 port, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like because I mean and, and they're all every one of them is used because they're all going out to some test device or Apple Watch or something. So like I have so many things in here that charge via USB, so it's nice to kind of have those and then I, now I have this other array of ports that I can plug drives into and things that I feel like should be plugged directly into the computer. Um because I never felt good about plugging my backup drive you know into the hub because i mean it's fine because it's a backup drive but it's it's the kind of thing where you feel like a direct connection would be good for bandwidth purposes well and also a lot of times direct connections are the only reliable connections you know for a lot of peripherals a lot of adapters and hubs and things 
they are like 99% reliable, but not 100% reliable. And for, you know, for certain tasks, that matters a lot. Like, you know, things that are related to like my network connectivity or my audio interfaces for podcasting, I need those to be 100%. Um, yeah. And, you know, and, and, you know, like my keyboard, like <laughs> I, I can't have my keyboard drop, you know, 1% of its keystrokes or repeat things or be weird. And I've, I have had those issues with a lot of hubs and adapters I've used in the past. So I, and you know, this is a much bigger problem on the laptops and the desktops, uh, especially the, the more recent ones. But um, there's, there's a lot of reasons why the ports that are built in to computers tend to be a hundred percent reliable. Whereas anything that's broken out with a hub or anything tends to not be quite a hundred percent a lot of the time. Yeah. And so it's great to have those extra ones. And as a brief aside, I, my main, like the way I typically am working when I have, when I'm developing is I'll have, you know, a iPhone, depending on which, depending on what I'm developing and what I, where I am, you know, one of my various test iPhones, um, you know, plugged into, you know, plugged directly into my computer with lightning. I know you can do the wireless version of this now, but I just like the lightning version because I'm old and curmudgeonly. Um, but one thing I was curious was, is if the USB-C to lightning cable would be a faster way to do that process than the USB-A to lightning cable. And so uh, this last week, I actually did an experiment that I figured I'd mention on the show where I you know, was just basically benchmarking how long it took to move files and things back and forth when it was plugged in uh, via the USB-C to lightning versus USB-A to lightning. Turns out it's basically the same. Um, it's basically a wash between the two, which makes me think the, the bottleneck is on the phone rather than on the on the computer because clearly more data could be pushed through um, the USB-C port to the lightning cable or the lightning cable is the the bottleneck. But along the short of it, I figured I'd mention it here that it's I pre, while I appreciate having the extra USB-C ports because now when I can have a dedicated direct connection as my primary development plug, um, it's not a, it's not there for speed. It's probably just there for reliability and not having to go through the hub. So, you know, you win some, you lose some, I suppose. Yeah, actually, minor feedback on that. Um, I would be interested to see if the test is the same if you if you're using a uh, a, a 10.5 or a 12.9 inch iPad Pro, um, because those I think are the only iOS devices that actually have USB 3 support on their Lightning port. As far as I know. All of the iPhones and every iPad except the 10.5 and the 12.9 Pros, um, the the internal USB parts of their Lightning plug are USB 2. And I think the USB-A to Lightning cables are also USB 2 cables, whereas the USB-C to Lightning cable is USB 3 cable, and the 10.5 and 12.9 have USB-C, or have USB 3 as their interfaces. Okay, so maybe it is just, yeah, so I, 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 was, I will admit I was testing with an iPhone 10, so I didn't actually, but I can certainly repeat the test with an iPad. Uh, our, our iPad Pro and see if it works any better. Yeah, but, but not the 9.7. That's that's yeah. still USB 2. It has to be a 10.5 or a 12.9. Anyway, yeah, that's... And, and I have I, I have found, too, like, the wireless debugging, I, I like it, I, but it's... I, I don't know if it's, like, when I upgrade to a new beta or something, but a lot of times it just stops working. Like, I have to... Then I have to, like, plug in the phone to reconfigure it. And so I just, like, it's kind of annoying. Yeah. And, and that's not what you want. Like, you don't want... You you don't want your debug cycle to be ever so ever so every so often just to stop working. <laughs> it, it's already the most inconvenient part of development is that sort of this, the cycle where you're kind of you're making a change and then you're building and deploying it to your phone and then going back and forth. So yeah, I, I will continue to use a, a plug directly plugged in, and now I'm using USB C to Lightning just because now I can have you know I have an extra port that I can dedicate to that, um, and it seems to work really well. Um, the last thing I think it makes sense to probably close off talking about is I always find um, getting a new machine is kind of an interesting process just as it's an opportunity to see how portable your setup is. And I think as a sort of a slightly more meta point, like it's an important thing if you're self-employed to think about how portable your your setup is because you are going to be like you're responsible for being able to continue work progress irrespective of whatever is going on externally. Like if your, you know, if your computer has a horrible problem and has to go to the shop um, and for two weeks or whatever, you ha- even if just you have to, you know, buy a new computer for some, you know, you, you spill water on it and it breaks or, um, you know, it falls off your desk or whatever. Like if something happens, and you, you need to be able to continue to work. And so it's an important thing, I think, to use getting a new computer as an opportunity to see how portable your setup is to see how quickly you can get set up and going 
um, onto a new machine because you it's you know you want to practice it when the stakes are low rather than having to practice uh, when the stakes are high. When suddenly like you know you're in in a situation where you have a critical bug fix you need to do, and then your computer dies for some reason, and then all of a sudden you you're you're in a really big problem. Even if you went to the Apple Store, bought a brand new laptop, brought it home. If you don't have all the files you need, if you don't have, if you're not kind of, if your setup isn't portable in that way, if you're entirely reliant um, on the data on that drive, like you're going to be in a, in big trouble. So, hey, it's always a good thing to keep in mind that I trust and hope that you have a a, a robust backup solution that allows you to make this process straightforward. That, like I said, I have a daily clone of my main development machine that I is just always running, and it means that if ever my you know, something were to happen, I will at most lose a day's worth of work, probably less than that because of, you know, syncing and check-ins and things. But at worst, it would be that. And it's a bootable backup. So if I worst came to worst, I could just get any laptop, any Mac laptop ever, plug my, you know, plug my backup into that boot from that. Um, And at least even if it's not as uh, optimized of a setup, I could do it there. But um, anyway, just worth worth mentioning. Um, and from when I was doing my, my migration to this new computer, I tried to keep track of the things that become part of that. And it's like, I need to move over all my code. I need to move over all my assets, uh, graphic design assets, like Photoshop files, things like that. Um, migrate my SSH keys so I can connect all my machines, all my signing keys, which you can, there's, a, in theory, Xcode makes much easier now with all of its tools but i in practice i found it still was a bit cumbersome and problematic but oh yeah it, the, this is the know. the import and export developer profile settings in xcode's account pane yes hmm. i i've had great luck with that it's always worked for me it's like i always find that it works maybe it's just because i have so many apps but like i find that it, it inevitably there's some little thing that catches me out um and i have to do something in a slightly more manual process or export the keychain from my old computer and move it into my new computer and kind of merge them together or uh, things like that. But overall, it's certainly gotten a lot better. And the automatic code signing stuff helps a lot with this too, that at least once you have the base signing keys transferred over, then it can take care of a lot of, if you're missing other profiles or things, it can take care of that a lot for you now. Um, one thing that I do, I have run into recently that I was kind of a funny thing is I forgot that I run a local development database. Um, like I have a Postgres database that's just running on my main computer. Oh, sure. And which, you know, it's like, but it's, I, in my, for some reason, I got so used to the fact that all my databases are remote and hosted on Linode servers that I'd kind of totally forgotten that when I, um, you know, when I, I kicked up a development environment and it's like, can't connect to the database. And it's like, what do you mean you can't connect to the database? And it's like, oh, right. That's because the database is on the computer that's sitting on the floor <laughs> next to me. And so I had to remember to go and get the actual, like the data from the database and move it over into the, into, into the new, the new computer, even though I had set up Postgres on it as part of my process. One thing I, I, I like to do for this is um, keep certain um, files and scripts for doing new computer setup in Dropbox. Uh, I have a whole a whole Dropbox folder for basically like setting up a new computer, and it, conf- it includes a couple of shell scripts for doing things like configuring uh, Homebrew and and installing the home the Homebrew apps that I use, you know, on my Mac, you know, so that I, I can run that whenever there's an OS upgrade or whenever there's you know a new machine or a clean install. Um, and and just like a like you know checklists, I always I always look at Casey's checklist and moving to a new computer that he here on his blog that we'll link to because it's great. <laughs> it includes, includes a lot of stuff that I might uh, sometimes forget, like you know deauthorizing and reauthorizing certain applications and iTunes and things like that. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's it's something that it's really nice to like write down, keep in a list. Uh, and keep that list somewhere that that you will find it, and that's obvious, like Dropbox. Inevitably, there will be steps to the migration process that you want to remember, or that need, or you need to remember that you will very likely forget if it's not in a list. Like you could, in theory, use like Migration Assistant or like make your make a clone and deploy that clone onto your computer. But I really, lo- I think the process of going through that checklist and going through and rebuilding is so useful, and because it only happens every couple of years. Um, it's something that's worthwhile doing. And I will say, always keep a snapshot clone of your old machine um, and keep that drive like forever. Um, I have found, I've started, it's a habit I got into where I keep the last snapshot of every development machine I've ever had. And even if I end up just, you know, getting rid of that computer, I sell it or I give it to a friend or a family or whatever, like whatever ends up happening, I have a snapshot of that machine. And the number of times that is proved invaluable for going back and finding some file that I thought I'd checked in, but I hadn't. 
Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's come back time and time again to save me. So highly recommend just take, you know, take a snapshot, put it on a hard drive, label what it is, put it on a shelf. You never know when you're going to, that can come into handy in the future. So always, you know, recommended practice. It's a good tip. All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. And we'll talk to you next week. Bye.